Welcome to Convoy Radio. This is the podcast reporting on the ever-changing freight industry. My name is Jake Henderson. And I am Michael Lewis, and we are going to be bringing you ideas and leading voices from this fast-changing world of transportation and logistics. Now, Mike, our show is going to bring together the people that you want to hear from and get their take on the future of our business. Tune in for an inside look at today's opportunities and tomorrow's revolutions in the trucking industry. Wow. Here we are again. What time is it? It's 8.05. What is today? Wednesday? Today's a Wednesday morning. Michael, as always, you are here with me. It's a distinct pleasure that I routinely have on this show. How are you this morning? Your hair is still wet from the shower, my friend. Takes a little bit to dry these yeah. days. I've been growing it out. No good reason. Really just kind of apathy about getting a haircut and wanting to see what happens. If it's just flowing <laughs> Apathy around. about getting a and, haircut. Uh, yeah, it turns out when your hair is longer, it takes longer to dry. Usually have that like short haircut. It takes five minutes now. Yeah. Probably like up to an hour, hour and a half now. That's a problem I'm slowly losing. I think I'm losing my hair, guys. Yeah? Yeah. Slowly looking back, we should have it's like terrible. A, <laughs> in the podcast, like office area, which we don't have yet, but we like have a meeting room we're always in. Okay. We should have like a timeline uh, of a me time losing me. No. A month and just. No, see. I don't support that at all. Why not? And then we can have like a line with a marker. <laughs> could be a good no. Idea. No, no. Well, maybe, maybe. If if it's for laughs, I'm always we in. We could do a poll. We could be like, all right, here's where it is now. How oh, long until it gets to here? And do like a poll and have a prize. I usually don't mind being the butt of a joke, but there's just something about a man <laughs> losing his hair that is just, it's That's not fair. fun. It's not fun. I don't know. I think you could pull off bald pretty well, though, especially if Do you, you think I have the right shape head? I think if you pull out the mustache <laughs> more, then okay. yes. I think that would be a strong combo. Okay. I am trying to grow my mustache out. I like that. I am trying to grow Me my too, mustache out. We were talking, tell. I was actually talking about you on my drive to work this morning, Michael Lewis. Yeah. And you have a really distinct personality in terms of like, you are very intelligent, but you're also like this beach bum surfer kind of guy. And mixed with your brothers, you're just an odd mix, they dude. I want to be a surfer because I can't surf, but I would love to. But yeah, beach bum all the way. Beach bum all yeah. the way. Yeah, I picture you in a pair of board shorts. I picture you in a pair of board shorts, like on a small four person boat, just fishing for marlin for the rest of your life. Like once you leave <laughs> Convoy, Convoy Radio. I'd love to fish for marlin on any kind of boat. It'd be a little. Well, more rowdy if it was on a small boat, but yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I guess, okay, yeah, you no. probably would need a bigger boat. Those are some big fish. I mean, as long as we get it in the boat and yeah, that's all that really matters. But yeah, I don't want it to take the boat down. Can you eat marlin? Absolutely. Do you eat marlin? I don't know. I've never done it. A marlin like, steak? I'm sure that there's food. We should probably see if it's even legal. Let's Hold see. On, I think it's catch and release. Will you go Google that? <laughs> it's, it's, like it's, sport. Catch, yeah. it's like a sport. Marlin is like a sport fish. Yeah. You don't You're eat marlin. Because so you wouldn't eat a shark or would you eat a shark? Most people don't eat shark, but eat totally shark. people do. You could, yeah, you could eat a shark. I'm yeah. looking at going. I want to go down to Mexico and do some fishing off like the coast of Cabo. That's exactly where you get them. <laughs> I'm the wrong person for that job, so I need to have somebody that like knows what they're doing, or else it's a risk. People it's eat marlin, but a lot of people don't like it when people eat marlin. Oh, apparently <laughs> from from the three seconds that I've been looking at the oh. Google search of do people eat marlin. It's not appreciated, but, but pe- I mean, you can this do guy's it. eating smoked marlin. It was pretty good. I guess you can eat anything, right? Like you could eat a human, but people mm-hmm. aren't going to like it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I heard, I heard a podcast so about that. Food. Actually, yeah. you heard a podcast on that? Well, I mean, like Donner Party when people were going yeah. sketch. West. Anywho, should, should we do news? I mean, yeah, we can totally do news. We, do we want to talk about? I mean, we're talking about all these choices of what people are eating and not eating. And, okay, I mean. That kind of goes into the theme of like the science of choices and what we're going to be talking about later today. Do you want to introduce our topic and then we can do news and hit a break? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Was that the Olympic theme song? No, it's dun, 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 dun. That's the perfect theme for our, our topic today, which is economics. There's a clear line between the Olympics and economics. Mm-hmm. You decide for yourself. So... I'm actually really excited today. I get a little bit nervous in situations like this where I'm talking about concepts that are oftentimes very far over my head. So today we have Aaron Tarazis and Aviad Benzikri. Aaron is our freight economist and he was brought on to Convoy. How long have you been with Convoy now, Aaron? I joined back in March, so five months-ish. Okay, fantastic. And what is your background? Because it's a pretty decorated background, especially somebody sitting in my position looking out. Yeah. So before joining Convoy in March, I was economist, director of economic research at Zillow, the real estate 
online portal that I'm sure many of you use to snoop on your neighbors. I was there for oh, about five years. And I didn't then, know you could do that. I might do that now. <laughs> yeah, how do, Good how going. You, what kind of tool is it? Yeah. So, <laughs> so you, you just like search your address or anyone's address and see how much the house is worth. Oh, go on or how on. much they paid for it. Or how much they paid for it. Exactly. Before Zillow, I was at the U.S. Treasury Department working in Washington, D.C. I was an economist there, basically staffing the chief economist there for a little over a year. It was a, a weird experience. What's that like? What are the offices like at the U.S. Treasury yeah, Department? Very grandiose. Really? Um, yeah, it's like right next door to the White House. Uh-huh. And you wear a suit and tie every day uh-huh. just basically for the security guards because like no one else really cares if you're wearing a suit and tie. Mm-hmm. What do you mean for the security guards? Why just for the security? Oh, you have to go through security each day to get in the building. Like they like do a full like airport scan of you. And uh, it's easier if you're in a suit and tie or they just know that you belong there. <laughs> don't give out secrets I, I, because you, like... You, if- you, I think you look out of place if you don't wear a suit, suit and tie. Okay. Like, or like the women equivalent of a suit and tie. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you wouldn't fit in yeah. in the U.S. Treasury <laughs> Department. Tie? Yeah. I mean, I have one. <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> it's it's there. The same thing <laughs> every day. I got it for a while. I wore it to my bar mitzvah when I was 13. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, glad to have you on the show. We're going to tackle some really kind of noteworthy topics today. Recession, empty miles, also the great owner-operator debate, as I kind of like to call it. It's it's a hot topic right now. But I also want to introduce Aviad. And Aviad, am I wrong in saying that you, how do I want to word this? Not this that this is your brainchild, but you're like intimately involved in the concept of why we brought a freight economist on and like its purpose in the marketplace and specifically at Convoy as well. Yeah, I wouldn't give myself any credit for being a brainchild situation. Okay, what cool. I would say is Aaron and I actually joined about a month apart back in February. I joined the company. And one of the first things I look to tackle is how do we talk about the data that we sit on as a company that mm-hmm. we have access to? And then how do we ultimately make that valuable to our customers, whether it's shippers and or carriers? And so once Aaron came on him and I've been working very closely on that. When you say data, right? Because this is a relatively new concept in the freight industry altogether is like our ability to collect data. What kind of data are you talking about? It's a hot topic, right? Facebook is kind of in the news right now with selling off their data. Like what data are people able to collect now that is actually useful in terms of like predicting markets and making smart decisions? I'm sure we'll get into this later on when Aaron talks about empty miles, but that's one really key place, which is when people are using the Convoy app, we have access to their location. That's kind of key to the entire experience for both us and the carrier and the shipper. And being able to have that access, you can understand how much they're moving, how often they actually have a load, when they're empty, when they're stuck in traffic, all these different things. So it basically allows us to have a broader picture mm-hmm. than just surveys that can sometimes, and again, Aaron will likely talk about this, but Surveys can have bias. They can also have just misstatement data. But on the other side, when you have a smartphone relaying like exactly where it is, there's not much room for bias there. Mm, mm. Okay, so we'll, we, we'll we'll dive into that. Before we get too deep into the weeds, should we jump news? Yeah, bring us back bring out because I'm going to go full deep into this. Deep and once we're in, we're in. Yeah, once you start allowing me to ask questions, we're, we're off to the races. Yeah, there's, no, so, there's no coming out. Michael, bring us back. We'll turn our fantastic news music on. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. I think we should just have you make different music for all the different segments. Do you think I'm qualified for that? I think no, but that's why I want you to do it. (laughs) Yeah, okay, perfect. You just like to see me fail and lose my hair. I don't think that's it. I just like to see what you come up with on the spot. Okay. Any hoosers. (laughs) So right now, news for today is the truck driver shortage reaches the highest level ever. This is coming in from supermarketnews.com. And I think this one's interesting because... I was definitely hearing about a driver shortage for quite a while there. It's for the consistent. record, I've heard about this, I don't know, three, it's been three years now. Of of how many years? <sighs> Why do you do this to me? Why do you, <laughs> I've been in the industry for six years now. There, yeah. we got it out of the way. We can okay. continue. Yeah. Everybody can make fun of me. Yeah, I'm okay. a nerd. So yeah, I mean, this driver shortage has been talked about for years now and not as much recently with kind of the slower Q1 that we just went through, but yeah, the driver shortage reached the highest level ever. It's saying that we need like over 100,000 new drivers in the next five years and 160,000 drivers by 2028. Those are some big numbers. And that's saying that there's going to be a lot of freight coming in, which is great. And we like that. It's just kind of counter to what we've been hearing more recently with like the hot market in 2018. Mm-hmm. A lot of people went out and bought trucks. We thought that maybe we over-indexed. So it's going to be interesting to see if all of those trucks that were bought that haven't been used quite as much are going to now start seeing consistent work and even be like overburdened and have 
a really high load to truck ratio pretty soon in all these different markets. I feel like this is a really nuanced topic. And I know like Aaron, we were discussing it even before we started to hit the record button here. Mm -hmm. I think the statement that there's a driver shortage is a lot about positioning or is it even real at all? We might, let's get your opinion right now. Cause you're kind of making eyeballs at me right now. And <laughs> you're the man to answer this question. Yeah. Yeah. I spent some time thinking about shortages in, in grad school and before that. And, and the reality is, you know, a shortage is almost as much a political statement as it is an economic statement. It really, your perspective on a shortage just depends on where you sit in the market. If you're looking to buy trucking services, there's always a shortage. If you're looking to sell trucking services, there's never a shortage. Mm. And so, you know, when we think about the near-term ups and downs, you, you talked about the really kind of changing market dynamics that we've seen in freight rates over the past couple of quarters. You know, a year ago, they were kind of skyrocketing and, and now they seem to be in a free fall. It's hard to justify kind of what we're seeing right now with rates, with this idea that there's just not enough drivers out there. If anything, there's too many mm. kind of drivers and too many trucks out there right now. Think about the difference between the short-term fluctuations and long-terms. You know, no doubt there's going to be a shortage 20, 25 years from now, but that's a long way off. You know, the famous saying is that, you know, in the long term, which is when the shortage will happen, we're all dead. So how much do we really care about the long term versus the short term? Love the long term. I'm all about it. So you're saying if you are supplying trucks, then there is never a shortage because you're always going to want more demand and you'll go get trucks in that case. And so you're like, oh, there's, there's never going to be a shortage. Like we can supply as much as you need. And on the flip side, there always seems to just be a shortage because you have to pay more continually for more supply. Yeah, is I that mean, kind of th that's saying? a little bit in the extreme. You know, if yeah. you're looking to earn money off of driving a truck, you want wages to go up. Mm -hmm. And when there's not enough people to drive trucks, that means kind of the price should go up. That's how you get more people driving truck, getting more people to invest in trucks. So I think a lot of this depends on, on where you sit. You're saying that like, because you can go out and acquire more supply or demand theoretically, it's kind of a perception of like what you want the market to do. And you're going to advocate for what you want the market to push towards and terms of surplus or shortage. Yeah, okay. exactly. But again, you think about the long-term demographic changes. We've never had a higher number of truck drivers who are 55 plus. Mm -hmm. We even see a growing share who are 65 plus out there on the road. Sooner or later, those people can't drive anymore, right? And once they exit the industry, it's not clear who's going to replace them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that ties in pretty well to the different podcasts we've done in the past, whether it's expanding to younger people like 18 year olds on the road potentially, or even expanding the education program that we have in terms of having high school programs for kids to learn about commercial trucking. It seems like that's almost a necessity, man, is like getting these younger drivers into the marketplace and just marketing it to them. Yeah. I think this goes really interestingly into our next oh, goodness. News story. Wait till you hear this one, guys. I know. So there's two or three people who have actually been indicted for selling fake commercial driver licenses taking bribes taking bribes to give them out this is which, down in texas yeah this is down in texas surprised it's and, not florida to be honest um it was <laughs> florida man does this um <laughs> and this is down in texas and there was someone working for i forget what the department's called but basically the person who normally oversees the test that someone has to take to get a cdl they're taking bribes handing them out to people to become drivers. And I think to me, and I don't know how experienced these people were beforehand, but this is almost more intimidating than say a younger person going through full training, passing their tests, and then being able to drive something like 215 yeah. licenses were sent out to people who didn't actually pass a test to become commercial driver's licenses. And like from what I've seen or like hearing stories from drivers and then seeing how difficult it looks to drive these trucks on the road and all the different maneuvers they have to do. It's pretty scary to think about someone who hasn't actually been trained on a semi truck driving out there. Can you imagine me going up to somebody that issues commercial driver license and be like, Hey, here's a grand, put it in your pocket, give me a commercial driver's license. And now imagine. I'm on the road. <laughs> like that is what we're dealing with, but 215 times. So since mm -hmm. then those 215 CDLs, they have been canceled. Thank goodness. This guy that was actually selling them, turned out informant for the police. He obtained video footage of these bribes actually happening. So as I'm reading this, I'm Wait, like, so I just got done watching The Sopranos. Wow. He's a rat. Wow. <laughs> He's a rat. He did the right thing, right? Obviously, like he was issuing 215 CDLs, but he turned government informant, which is pretty incredible. Here's my question though. Yes. 
Did they immediately revoke those 215 or did they wait for the investigation to complete? Because that's a lot of people a driving question. very large. <laughs> Let me read this. The 215 the CDLs in question have been canceled according to the FBI. The FBI did not disclose which Texas DPS office Blackman worked for. Oh, the guy's name was Blackman. Uh, but he said he has been with the state agency since 2012. So they don't say how long they waited. So he didn't turn into an informant. That was his original job was to go out and set this up. Maybe I missed it. No, 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 no. He was doing it. They found out about it in the 2018 audit. Got and it. then they said, hey, buddy, time to put on the old microphone and camera because we're going to work. So interesting world down there. Hey, in the- at least the, I mean, the scary thing is oh, you on. feel like if this 215 licenses happened like how many across others? the U.S., how many have actually gotten sold and not gotten caught? Mm. I mean, you have to assume that this isn't like isolated and not the first time that someone's tried to get, I mean... I mean, this how, thing how happens in times? T-balls. We got we got twenty four year old Cuban baseball players playing, you know, little league World Series. It happens in every industry, you know. Are you just talking about the movie Benchwarmers? <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing. I remember the little okay, league World okay. Series. Okay. Should we get back to the podcast here? Sure. We're getting a little off topic. Okay, Aaron, I'm going to do something different. Normally, we do what we call the lightning round at the end of our podcast, no. but I want people to get to know you because we're about to go deep into recession and a lot of data heavy stuff. Truckonomics. So my first truckonomics, is, we've coined that term. Is um, that what we're going with? I don't know. We're going to have to talk we to could. them. Yeah. We're going to have to talk to them <laughs> right now. Your official title is freight economist. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're going for. I'm going to call you a, a, a truck anonymist, a truck anonymist, <laughs> a truck anonymist. Thank yeah. you. I yeah, added yeah, an yeah. extra syllable yeah. in there. We'll get that on CNBC. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're going to be on squawk box in yeah. no time. Okay. My question to you, I got to come up with a question now. If you could be reincarnated as any animal, what animal are you choosing? Uh, you, you really picked a good one because Thank I've thought about this one. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I'd say a mosquito. Uh, no. Yes. And no, I'll not t- a I'll mosquito. Tell you, I'll tell you why. Well, that's annoying. No, because if you think about, you know, humans were this all powerful creature on the earth. We can control the environment. We can control, you know, basically any animal we want to dominate. The one animal that kind of continuously brings humankind to its knees is the mosquito by transmitting disease. You think malaria, you think, you think Zika, you know, it's almost like a truth to power thing. They are the ones that are going to outlive us. Okay. But any individual, as, any, as a any, whole any species, dark, sure. Yes. Any individual mosquito is going to die if it touches me, but you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But like, yeah, that's an interesting choice. Yeah. I never would have gone yeah. that route. I would have said silverback gorilla. Have you ever <laughs> seen those. one of those silverbacks run? That is an intimidating sight. Michael, what about you? Hold um, on. Can I guess? You can, yeah, you can guess. Hmm. Let me just investigate you real quick. I see you coming back as like, like a dachshund, like a wiener dog, because like you're cute, you're lovable, people like to hang out with you. You're tall, you're lanky. To look at what a dachshund is to know if I'm offended or not. <laughs> Hold on. Is that- Go ahead and pull that up. I, it, I you know. spell it like D O X O N, not a dash hound. I always get dachshund. And dash. Oh come on. Man. <laughs> That's cold. Is that is that not a moth? I mean, my my choice is going to be a jaguar because I've always thought they're really oh, that's cool. Sick, but you know, <laughs> you win some, you lose. There, some. there could be worse things. There could be worse things. <laughs> okay, I mean, a dachshund's basically a degenerate jaguar. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the jaguar that's down on his luck. Jeez. <laughs> All right, we're back into this thing. Dun 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 dun. dun. Aaron. The first thing that we did want to talk to you about is recessions, right? We hear all of this stuff about a freight recession, drivers not making as much as they think they should be, driver shortages. My question to you is, are we in a freight recession? And does that freight recession match like actual economic recessions that, you know, more people are familiar with? That's a great question. Something that I think you hear about a lot. The reality is anyone who's been in the freight industry for more than a blink of the eye kind of has felt ups and downs. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) Six years now. So anyone who's kind of been around kind of knows that there are booms and then there are busts. There are booms when prices rise and people add new supply and then the prices go down. So there is this obvious cyclicality, if you will, to the freight industry. Now, some people interpret that as saying, well, maybe there's the same cyclicality that we see in the overall economy. You know, U.S. economy overall experiences booms and busts. Everyone, you know, who's more than, you know, five years old remembers the recession of 2007, 2008. That was the last big recession that we had. It's been kind of continuously expanding. But, you know, freight has its own pattern. And 
you know, the longer the U.S. economic expansion goes on, the more it begins to raise questions about when does this end? You know, the U.S. economic expansion that began in 2009 is is now the longest in, in U.S. history. It, it just passed that mark in July. So Is like the indicator for that, like GDP is constantly going up or are there multiple indicators? Yeah, so and again, <laughs> I'm just throwing stuff yeah, out no, here. You're, Correct you're, me if I'm... <laughs> on, on, on the nose, yeah. So there are a lot of different indicators that, that go into the official definition, but you can basically proxy that by looking at real GDP. How much is the U.S. economy producing? And when that goes down, that's a recession. And so the freight industry has something similar. We did a recent analysis on this that we posted on the Convoy blog. Check it out if you haven't. That looks at kind of what is the demand for freight services and when has it gone down over time? And and basically, no surprise to many of kind of your listeners, I'm sure, it's been contracting since about October 2018. So about seven, eight months now. We're about seven, eight months into the most recent freight recession, if you will. And when you obviously like the indicator of a freight recession is there's a decrease in volume that shippers are are putting out into the marketplace. Yeah, that's right. It's an output based metric. Okay. So, so kind of more of the demand than the supply side. Obviously, when people are talking about ups and downs, they often think of prices, which are a little bit more than just demand. It's the interaction of demand and supply. Right. Mm-hmm. So a question I have about that is we talk about recessions and we know that there's so much that can go into a recession between like international trade, as we've seen some things happen with the tariffs. But I know that expectations can play a lot into this as well, especially when you're at this point where you're like, this is the longest economic expansion we've had. At some point, it has to change, right? Does like an economic expansion have to have a dip at some point? Or is it like a lot of it going to be expectation of like, okay, we're still going, we're still going. And then more and more and people start to get on that wagon of it's got to be coming soon. And then slowly their decisions pile up. Expectations do play a big part in what shifts the economic environment. There's a lot of research around how psychology kind of, you know, can drive markets. You know, there's nothing fixed about the lifespan of an economic expansion. You know, as I said, the longest economic expansion in U.S. history is about 10 years. But other countries have had much longer economic Mm. expansions. You think Australia has been in economic expansion for 28 years. Canada has had expansions close to 20 years. Some U.S. states never really experienced the 2001 recession or even the 1991 recession. So basically, we're expanding from 1982 to until 2007. You know, that's a 30-year run. Yeah. So there's nothing mechanical about kind of these the timing of these booms and busts. But you're right. Kind of people get nervous. They stop spending. They hold their credit cards back. You know, they start putting money into safe assets rather than kind of risky assets, which make the economy grow. And all of that kind of cascades into to slowing consumption. I think it might be also to call out or be interesting to call out exactly how you define a recession, right? What is the period required to kind of say this is not just a blip on the radar, but this yeah. is actually a recession? Yeah. So there, there are slowdowns that don't quite qualify as recession. To be a recession, you have to be six months of continuous declines, mm-hmm. you know, two quarters. It is, that, is that measured month over month? Is it measured week over week? So, it, yeah, it's measured annual changes. So... For six consecutive months, it's lower than it was a year before. Ah, I see. Okay. That's interesting, too, with what you're saying about how expectations can play into a recession, in theory. Because at first I was thinking, okay, that may play a part in like the overall economic recessions, but not as much in freight-related recessions. Because like if you're going to produce something, it's not really an expectation as a truck driver. You're going to take loads as long as there are loads to take. As long as the demand's there, you're going to be getting more trucks. But it sounds like if people are putting their credit cards away, if they're not spending as much, that there's going to be less production potentially down the line if people are buying fewer items. Yeah. no, Because there's so many consumer, like, for example, like consumer palletized goods is a huge, like, set of volume within the freight industry. Yeah, that's right. That That's kind of the, the link between the bigger recessions, economic recessions, and the freight industry. But expectations, I think, do play a role in kind of the freight booms and busts. You think about what happened two years ago. Prices were high. People had the expectation that they were going to stay high, mm-hmm. invested a lot. They didn't stay high. And, you know, it, it can kind of cause those movements like that. Based on your research and, and what have you seen in terms of like the lengths of uh, freight recessions in general, right? Because they don't kind of mirror the long, lengthier, full economic recessions or booms, right? Those tend to be longer. What is the typical length of like a freight market change, if you will? That's a great point. In our research, the typical freight recession was about 10 months. That's compared Mm. to about 12 months for the typical economic recession. Now, 
if you take away freight recessions that coincided with a broader recession, they tend to be even shorter. Mm. So if you think about a freight recession that's not happening at the same time as the rest of the economy is collapsing, those recessions typically only last about seven months. So, you know, about three months less time. That's the median. So there's a range around that. But that's kind of the baseline expectation. Why so. would a freight recession be shorter than a general economic recession if they're so related in terms of like, all right, if we're not buying as much, if we're not producing as much, all that stuff's going to be shipped. So you'd think they would have some sort of, even if there's a lag involved, yeah, like one started and then the other one started a couple months later, you'd think similar time periods you'd expect, right? You think about how many freight businesses work, they adjust relatively quickly to kind of changing economic conditions, not painlessly, but relatively quickly. When there's excess demand and prices are rising, it's, you know, a relatively quick you know, timeline for them to, you know, add more drivers, add kind of, you know, be more efficient in, in their routes. Adding trucks is a little bit longer of a timeline, but but still not, you know, years length process. And the same way, kind of when prices are low or falling and there's excess supply, the freight industry responds pretty quickly. People kind of, you know, shut down trucks. People kind of temporarily leave the industry to work in, in other jobs. People kind of reduce the hours that they work. So, you know, compared to, say, a consumer or another business, the freight industry does react really quickly to these ups and downs. I'm kind of thinking back in like 2017 when it was the summer of 2017 and it was a little bit slow, a little bit slow. And then all of a sudden that summer hit, seasonality started to take peak. Does seasonality kind of shake things up a little bit? Like if something is stagnant, 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 all of a sudden what I kind of call the grilling states, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, they start producing poultry and things of that nature. Then you get a lot of tropical storms and then you get produce season down in the Southeast. Does that tend to like shake it up at all and, and maybe like proactively kick you out of recession? I mean, the analysis we did is it's all seasonally adjusted data. So okay. there are these predictable yearly trends, mm -hmm. like in summer, things rise and in winter, they fall. Kind of we can smooth through that and, and take around those those predictable Got yearly it. effects. Got it. So you take out my bias. Of yeah. course, I like that. That sounds reliable. <laughs> so when, when you're in these freight recessions, is there anything that people can do to help get out of them more quickly? Or like what is going to make it go from a state where we're spending less, we're producing less, we're spending less, we're producing less is a cycle. What gets us out of that into a place where we're expanding again? And then is there anything like your average like driver, your average like just person who's a part of the freight industry can do to like help the expansion start again? Well, let me take that second part of the question first about kind of, you know, what we can do to smooth through these booms and busts. I'm going to take an example from the housing industry, which, you know, I, I spent kind of a half decade on before coming to Convoy. You know, obviously during the, the boom of the mid 2000s from 2003 to 2007, home builders kind of saw there was a lot of demand. They built a lot of homes. And suddenly when the bottom dropped out of the market, there was not enough demand for those homes. And so a lot of home builders were burnt pretty hard in 2007 through 2009. Now, Come around a decade later, back in 2014, 2015, the housing market was starting to pick up steam again. Home builders didn't react the same way as they did a decade earlier. They were pretty restrained in adding new supply mm -hmm. during the most recent boom. That's one of the reasons we've seen home prices rise pretty quickly across the nation over the past few years. Now, you, you take that example and think about how that would play out in the freight industry. Well, you know, we saw prices rise very quickly for trucks two and a half years ago. People invest in supply. Now, it's important for that investment and for new supply to be out there, but it's also important to take a long-term perspective. You know, we all have experienced booms and busts, and during those periods of boom, it's, you know, keep in mind where you're going to be in four or five years. You don't want to be in that position of having overinvested. And that's at, really at tough, too. It's super tough because, like so many other industries, if you are an actor in this industry and you see all these people making, as I've heard the term buku bucks, like just a lot of money. And then you see people buying trucks and then just increasing the amount of revenue they make. It's hard for you to be like, okay, I need to be conservative. I need to like think about this long term so I don't buy too many trucks and have them sit empty when all this money is being made around you. And it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's like, am I going to do this to kind of hedge my bets and be conservative? Or am I going to try to like capitalize like everyone else is around me? And it almost That's a, gets into like a game theory situation where you're like, if I don't buy it and everybody else does, we're still in a shortage. So I'm in a bad situation. And if I 
do buy it and everyone else does and we're all in the shortage together. And if everybody doesn't buy and I do buy, then I can make the most like out of the situation. So it's tough for everybody to act in a way that's going to help long term. It's a tough individual decision. It's particularly tough when it's kind of such a, you know, a fragmented industry like mm-hmm. freight is. And there are people who are relatively new, may not have that same experience and are going to go gangbusters and, you know, make a quick buck. But, I, you know, I think in any business, that long-term perspective is important. And for, you know, not not every driver's in it for the long haul in the industry for- you know, No pun intended. Drivers, no pun intended. <laughs> but for those carriers and drivers who are, you know, that long-term perspective is, I think, important, as tough as it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've heard you discuss too, that freight is kind of like the leading indicator of the greater US economy. Can you kind of dive into that and like how closely it is tied to our economy, right? Like yeah. what certain indicators in the freight world will tell us about the overall economy? I feel like you always hear these these different ideas of what are different leading indicators for the state of the economy. Yeah. You, you hear that about freight, you hear that about housing, you hear that about certain parts of the financial market. The reality is, Recessions are few and far between, and, and each one has its own unique causes, right? So it's, it's hard to say that any particular thing is a leading indicator. Now, let's take movements in the freight economy you know, in and of itself. Yes, if you look at the past six recessions, kind of freight turned sour before the rest of the economy in four out of six of them. So you know, two-thirds of the time, the freight kind of economy led the rest of the economy. But freight has also had many other kind of busts that that didn't coincide with a recession nationwide. So if every time you saw freight go into a downturn, you said, well, that must mean that Mm. the U.S. economy is in recession, you'd be wrong half the time. You know, there have been 12 freight recessions since 1972 and only six U.S. economic recessions since 1972. So, you know, it's one of these questions that economists are, are terrible with where the answer is both yes and no, right? Yes, freight does tend to lead the overall economy in turning sour. But that's not always the case. There are lots of what we call false positives. So it's kind of like, put your finger up in the air, look around for a storm, but don't just abandon ship because you see some sort of freight recession, which I think is really healthy perspective because a lot of times, like so often, we look for any sort of leading indicator and just jump on it as fact, whether it's like looking at sports teams, economic recessions, just like the weather and we're like, this is going to happen. Right. And then we make irrational decisions based on that. So I think it's, Really good perspective to see as often as that does happen. It's like, don't abandon ship because of what your perspective is on this leading indicator. And I think that even goes back to tie in more strongly with your former point of, okay, maybe don't push all your chips in and just kind of have that conservative long-term approach. And that way you can react more efficiently to any indicators that come. I think that's just That's so difficult because I, and I wonder like, do drivers know this stuff, right? Has a driver ever been told. And I don't know, right? I'm not really intimately involved in that community yet. Hopefully I'll get out on the road one of these (laughs) days with you guys. But like, where would they get that information, right? Where are they having someone say, hey, I know that things are really good right now, but you know, don't go, as you said, gangbusters just yet. Like from an outsider perspective, like how are they supposed to know this? Who's been doing this research previously? (laughs) Has it been digestible for them? Where's it been available? Yeah. I mean, finding that information and information that you trust and, and reliable is always difficult. You know, there are a lot of kind of new outlets and information available, you know, beyond the two of you and your kind of news updates. There are? <laughs> <laughs> Freightways does, Freight does some great work. You know, trucking info, there are lots of outlets out there that I'm sure many of your listeners follow. But in the information age that we're living in, there is almost more growth in noise than signal. And yeah. it's hard to sift through all of that, that material. Got it, got it, got it. Well, that kind of like leads me, I want to push this even one step farther. And one of the things that you've recently researched is the idea of empty miles, wasted miles. Can you kind of introduce your research there and what you see as the issue with empty miles and what kind of is like an empty mile in general? Sure. For those of you who are familiar with Convoy, empty miles is obviously very core to our mission and, and what we're hoping to achieve in reducing those miles that drivers drive empty. There's a number of different ways people call them, non-revenue miles, deadhead miles. Mm. But basically the idea is that you're running a truck and you're not getting paid for running that truck because you don't have a load in it. That happens in a variety of ways. It happens between kind of dropping off and picking up your next load. It happens, you know, if you're kind of a local driver between the start of your day and your first pickup of the day or or at the other tail end of your day, or if you're kind of a long haul kind of, you know, at the end of your sequence or the start of your sequence. So there are different kind of a lot of different ways that you can think about empty miles. The point being is that A, drivers aren't getting paid for being on the road. 
and B, they're spending money on gas and wear and tear on their vehicle that doesn't need to be consumed. And, you know, part of what Convoy is doing is, is trying to reduce this. We try to put some numbers around the phenomenon. There are lots of numbers out there that you see. You see kind of some of the financial reports of the big kind of publicly traded trucking companies. You see numbers in those financial reports as low as 9, 10%. You see numbers on trucker kind of boards, things in up to 50% empty miles. So just like such a wide hmm. range of numbers. And, and it shocked me that no one had a really kind of firm sense of it. American Trucking Research Institute, part of American Trucking Association, puts out a number that's 20%. That's probably the most reliable firm statistic out there. Problem is that it includes a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of stuff that that most people don't necessarily think about when they think of the trucking industry. That term, the trucking industry, means so many different things to so many different people. I feel like it's dependent upon like how individual carriers run their business as oh, yeah. well. Like how great are dispatchers at their job? What freight do they actually have access to? Like how do you aggregate all of that? How do you even measure? So the way kind of it's traditionally been done it has been through surveys. The U.S. government Census Bureau used to run a survey from the 1960s up until about 2002 when they stopped doing it. ATRI has been doing it basically since then, asking this question about empty miles since 2013. So they ask a driver, you know, each year they say, you know, when they survey you, they'll call you up and say, what percent of your miles did you drive empty last year? And, you know, as I said, kind of surveys are right now. It's self-reporting. It's self-reporting. It's the most reliable instrument we have out there. But there are all sorts of kind of challenges in these surveys. You think about if I were to ask you, you know, how many times did you go out to eat at a restaurant last year? You'd tell me a number. It, and the number would probably be approximate, kind of close to reality. I would lie. I don't want people to know how often <laughs> I'm, go <laughs> I'm going out so yeah, late. But you're right. And there's also that incentive. Like another similar was, question is, think of what do you tell your dentist when oh, they ask you, how often do you floss? Every day, dentist. Exactly, every day. Like Get I floss all the time, now. several <laughs> times a day. But reality is, if it's a good week, three times a week, right? My gums uh, are speak always for yourself. bleeding, dentist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there are kind of competitive pressures, the desire to look good, you know, that can make surveys a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. There's Do you think if you have... Oh. Agency bias. Right? Yeah, there's, there's kind of economic terms for these things. One is called moral desirability bias, that, that desire to look good. Another is called recall bias, that kind of the imperfect memories that we all as humans have. I was going to say, do you think... And I, I don't think this concept actually applies here, but I've heard a lot of studies around like... Or this is actually the name of a book as well, called like The Wisdom of the Crowd, where if you have enough people guessing... yeah. Some people are going to be more accurate than others, but on average, the yeah. group is going to have a really accurate estimate. Do you think that only like would apply to things that aren't self-reflective because of those biases that we just talked about? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of very diverging opinions on this idea of the wisdom of the crowds. Mm -hmm. You take kind of a common approach to get at these indicators is to take a poll of polls and assuming mm -hmm. that, you know, some people will, will bias upward, some people will bias downward, and that'll all balance out. The reality is that only works if the people know a lot about what they're talking about. So, for instance, if I were to poll, you know, everyone in this room about, you know, what is the number of uh, $100 bills in circulation in the country, you guys would give me a number, but none of you know anything, I'm guessing, about that topic. I know, absolutely your, numbers, your, your guesses are going to be all over the place. However, if I asked like a bunch of bankers how many $100 bills are in circulation, they're probably going to give me a better guess on average than the people in this room. Do you know that number? I don't. Can we, <laughs> so Mike, can you look banker. that up? I'll I look can, it up. You, I can. So the question I have there is, again, this is a little bit divergent, but obviously you've heard of like the idea of estimating the weight of a cow and you have like nope. eight or 900 people out there. Some of them have no idea. Some of them are like ranchers, so they have a pretty accurate idea. And if you yeah. get all of their average, it's going to be pretty accurate. Yeah. Do you think if you surveyed like a thousand random people about the number of hundred dollar bills in the U.S. market in circulation, do you think it would end up becoming more accurate if it was just a completely separated group of people who we're not all influenced by like a Google search or anything and you just ask everybody and they're all independently acting? Yeah, yeah, it definitely kind of that theorem that, you know, there is this kind of uniform distribution and that all the errors balance out requires each person's guess to be independent of yeah. each other. They can't all have seen on the news last night that there are, you know, $40,000 bills out in circulation. Yeah, that's right. way low. There's 11.7 yeah. billion? He's like seven billion. Zeros. No, no way. Hold on, hold on. I Googled it up. I Googled it up. There's 11.5 billion $100 bills. That's crazy. In that's circulation. Wild. I don't have... 
any of them <laughs> <laughs> in my pocket or house. Not yet. Um, but yeah, bringing that idea back, I mean, if we look at, for example, like the DAT rate or the DAT rate on a specific lane, you yeah. think that that kind of comes down to all these different truckers having some idea about what it should cost at a certain time on a certain commodity yeah, and saying like, this is what I would be willing to get paid to do this lane. And then you have everybody kind of putting their information in that and then someone gets it. So it's, I mean? it's actually interesting kind of you raise that if you look at how the ATRI empty miles number has evolved since they first reported it, the first day they reported it in 2013, it was something like 13, 14%. And over the next three years, it converged to 20% after which it's been pretty stable. So what I suspect might be happening on there is people see the most commonly referenced number out there. And when they're asked about it, they might say, I'm probably pretty close to average. The average is 20%. Mm, mm. You know, let's put that number, right? We just both mm, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, getting, we're spending way too much time together, Michael Lewis. Yeah. I'll just add one piece here too. As we started talking about this, Aaron and I, we were thinking about all the different components that define an empty mile, right? So the idea is like, do you consider an empty mile when you're commuting to your first pickup or commuting home? Mm. Yeah. Do you consider an empty mile when you're going to get maintenance? Like there's so many different things. So to cut a number that is just like so clear is Next nearly example. impossible. Yeah. The definition's all over the place. Everyone's right. talking about something a little bit different. You know, everyone defines it a little bit different way and that makes it hard to do the apples to apples comparison. And then when we looked at like the trucks within the survey, there's trucks that we may not necessarily think of as trucks. Right. Lots of kind of small kind of, you know, vehicles, those kind of in-town vehicles, less than class eight, you know, light vehicles. Box medium, trucks and straight box trucks. Box trucks, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and to what degree are those actually representative of, you know, what most people have in mind when they think of interstate freight, which is a class eight, you know, dry van or reefer. So what are like the real implications of these empty miles, right? Wasted time, wasted fuel, just overall waste, like if we are able to correct this and we're able to become more efficient, we're able to yeah. reduce empty miles, what does that actually do for the market? Like yeah. paint that picture. So if drivers kind of can lower, obviously their empty miles, that means they're doing more rate paying loads. That means they're earning more per hour that they're out there on the road. That's kind of higher incomes mm -hmm. for, for them at the end of the day or at the end of the, the two week or whatever period. And to go back to where we started, you know, 20 minutes ago, higher pay means it's a little bit more attractive particularly to younger workers and, and you begin to attract kind of that new generation of drivers. Is empty miles a result of just traditionally how business has been done in the industry over the phone, lack of transparency, lack of knowing where all the available shipments are? Is there something coming around the corner or that already exists to prevent future empty miles? I think a lot of it too is technology, yeah. right? The ability to see things that even human beings can't see. If there is artificial intelligence doing some of this work or even more machine learning, kind of understanding behaviors and what's going on, human beings have a capacity for what they can get done. And when you look at what the technology that we're developing and competitors like ours are doing, at the end of the day, it enables things to happen that human beings just can't do on their own. So you can get to a point where you have just more efficiency. That's mm. the key, mm -hmm. is finding connections that just may not be obvious. Yeah. That's what I've been thinking too, right? The availability of all these load-bearing apps now that you can go and you can search all these different shipments. Once they reach density, your ability to go find a shipment is that much greater. That is five miles instead of 30 miles out or 40 miles out. You're no longer relying upon the DAT load board to find the absolute you know, closest one that they only know about that's 50 miles away. Instead, you can get one that is five, 10 miles away. Exactly. And then most recently, we had a announcement that we did, which is called automated reloads. And the idea is that for a, a carrier, it's not that, hey, you pick up here, you go from A to B, but we're helping them find A to B to C to D. And they can potentially even do a loop, mm. you know, get them out when they want to leave, get them home when they want to come back. And the idea is that we're putting these together and it's not a human being doing it. And that's kind of insane when you think about it, but that's like the ability of what technology can create. Just can move so much quicker, can see patterns that humans oftentimes overlook. Now, one of the things that's really difficult about that, just things go wrong on the road, right? So if you plan four moves out, like everybody knows, all drivers know, like you plan four moves out, you plan four shipments out, that first shipment, you may have rejected product at the first shipper, stuff goes wrong there. But I assume that technology can still step in and say, hey, something went wrong. Let's correct it ASAP. We have the algorithm built. We're ready for this. Exactly. Like, think about this. Like when you order yourself an Uber or a Lyft, and if the guy is too far away, it will automatically assign somebody else mm -hmm. to go pick you up. Mm -hmm. There's not a human being on the other side doing that. So we take that for granted in our everyday. Yes, we do. And in, in trucking, that's just something that hasn't been done before. And that's like where we are now. And it's only going to get better as mm. we continue to move along. Mm. Interesting. Now, 
to our last little point that I absolutely wanted to cover here. This is something that we've talked about. We've had truck drivers talk about this, but I'm happy to have somebody of your capacity kind of come in and, and lay some knowledge down. The great owner-operator debate, right? Knowing what you know about the market right now, is it wise to lease onto a company? Is it wise to buy your own equipment, buy your own truck, lease your own trailer? Kind of what have you seen? And are you willing to take a stance on that? Or is it super dependent on a ton of factors? Obviously is dependent on those factors, but I think how I would answer that is, you know, if you're good, yeah, it almost always makes sense to be an owner operator. Again, conditioned on if you're good. Our research looked at how much more or less do owner operators earn compared to company drivers? We controlled for a whole host of other differences between owner ops and company drivers. And, you know, basically in, in every year over the past decade, owner ops have done on average no worse than company drivers. And in good years, they've done better, but even in the worst years, they've done no worse. Again, that's on average. And we got to be careful with averages because, you know, no one is actually average. At you're all special. Out there. <laughs> when you say good, what do you mean by good? Like yeah. your ability to play the spot market, your ability to plan out routes. It's all of those factors, okay. you know? So if you are, as I said, a good owner operator, you can earn, you know, 20, 20,000 plus more than a company driver. If you're kind of the lower end of the performers for, for owner ops, you can earn less than a company driver. So it really requires an honest judgment of your own capacity and knowledge and, and skill in the market. What, like you were saying, is it better to, or not better, because you're saying usually they're no worse off yep. than a In the driver. worst years, they're no worse. In the good years, they're better. But on average, if you're making that decision, you're kind of on the line about whether you thought it'd be better for you to become an owner operator or a company driver. Would you look at the market as a factor and say, hey, it's slower now. I might not know the ropes as well. I might not be able to go out and get that higher value freight and keep myself from having all these deadhead miles. If it's a worse market, yeah. then if it was a better market, then it might be easier for you to go out and get your own authority and run. Yeah, that's a great point. Something I hadn't considered, but you're right. Kind of in difficult markets, that cost of learning is all the higher. So. And you have to do it fast because yep. I mean, there's so many different costs when you become an owner operator between startup costs for the business, whether you have to buy your own tractor trailer. At least now you can insurance. buy a CDL. You don't even have to test anymore down at <laughs> Yeah, let's, uh, what was our contact's name down there that we can... Blackman. Yeah, Blackman. Blackman. He's probably in federal holding at this yeah, point in time. Wah, wah, wah. That stinks. Is well, that man... Federal holding noise? Well, so, and, and it's, it's just so hard. <laughs> it's just so hard to, to, to tell somebody. And, and I always ask this question because I'm curious, right? Like, we always talk about owner-operators, especially here at Convoy. They are the larger chunk of the supply, right, as opposed to large asset-based carriers. But it's hard to tell somebody, hey, this is exactly it's, what you should do. It's it's a personal yep. decision that everybody's going to personal risk. Yeah, yep. yeah. So <laughs> I feel smarter already just having this conversation. Michael, let's do a lightning round question to All sign right. off because I was really intrigued by the mosquito thing. Yeah, I've never heard that before. B yeah. Bars high now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll be yeah. If you could be reincarnated as any Man. animal, I'm talking. I had all this time to think of it, and I didn't think of anything. I'm going to go with elephant. Why elephant? A wild elephant. I should be very oh, clear. Wild. I do not want okay. to be in a zoo. Uh, okay, you don't want to be in captivity. I'm going to say like an elephant in like the north of Thailand Ooh. because they are like, first of all, majestic creatures. Okay. Never seen one in person. they don't forget anything. Like they have this like incredible memory. And they're just like naturally gentle. Don't, I just think they're don't, awesome. Don't cross off yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I will stomp you. <laughs> I've, I've heard stories of elephants trucking. I shouldn't say trucking. Obviously, they're not trucking, but traveling hundreds of miles when a different elephant has died to like wow. attend and pay their respects to that elephant. Wouldn't surprise me at all. I heard that on a podcast. Don't quote. Well, I guess you can quote me, but I don't quote know. Quote me what, quoting the, someone else. Yeah, yeah. Quote me like quoting Michael somebody. Scott from The Office yeah, quoting thank Wayne you. Gretzky. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Michael, how do you feel at the end of this? Informed? Overwhelmed? You have a degree in economics, right? Yeah. So you're probably more well-suited for these conversations than I was. I don't know. I think we have different insights. I mean, you've been in the freight market okay. for six years Here we now, go again. I've only been in for a couple. <laughs> and so, I don't know. I think it just kind of like, is the tip of the iceberg when you look at what we're doing now and we're starting to get new insights on age old questions. And with this, like there was the feedback from, I think it was freight waves, correct? That like the data we were using in a lot of our research was older. But when you look at this, we're starting to ask the questions that everybody has been asking for decades. And with the technology and the data recording that just the industry has access to now, we're going to be able to dive deeper and deeper into these topics and all of those 
long-term questions that people have gone back and forth about with primarily anecdotal experience or just like experienced base like data we're going to be able to have deeper conversations really get to the bottom of a lot of these questions and i think this conversation is just the beginning of that. So I'm excited for stuff coming down the line. Like, obviously you don't want to say too much, but like, are you looking at investigating other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, yes. I guess I'm, I'm giving you, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay. Job. So what I'm like, what I'm, I'm trying not to be like, Hey, announce exactly what you're doing, well, but like, what else can we do? Let, let me, let me answer it this way. I think, you know, as an economist, one of the things that I enjoy most is hearing those anecdotes that that your listeners or, or or you guys have kind of what are the things that you feel are true that you've never quite been able to prove come to us with those we'll see if we can put data around them I, I like to take those questions and see if we can bring data to the questions that people have I love that and that's a great call out for our mailbag here if you wow. can email all of those questions that you have just questions you've had about the industry that you've always wanted more data and just kind of insights around, email them to podcast at convoy.com. We'll forward them over to our truckonomics department, patent pending. Patent and pending. yeah, we'll be able to go from there and hopefully dig into all of your guys' questions. So definitely send those in. Also, if you've thought about what animal that you want to be reincarnated as, please send a podcast at convoy.com. And I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Let's see if it's as, as good as a mosquito. So with that, it was another fantastic episode of Convoy Radio. Again, I oh, want to thank you, I Aaron. One more thing. Oh boy, real quick. I did some. Oh I did goodness some just, gracious! I mean, while we were talking, I just kind of went and researched, like Googled everything that we were talking about. Dachshunds. The spelling we got wrong. It's like it's a German dog, and it's actually spelled D A U C H S H U N D. That's what I was kind of dash dash hound. Oh, Z dash hound. I think that's how you say it. I, don't know. Our, I was born ride. in Chicago. I don't really have any German influence <laughs> yeah. in my life. Okay, we're wrapping this Sorry, up. We got to go. We have other that. jobs to do. Again, I want to thank Aaron. I want to thank Aviad for coming on to the show. This was fantastic. This was fun. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Yeah. Michael? Keep that dirt side down. Keep that dirt side down. All right, everybody. Adios. Thanks for listening to Convoy Radio. Remember to email us at podcast at convoy.com with questions, comments, truck tips, and stories from the road. Please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Convoy Radio is recorded at A-Train Studios in Seattle, Washington. Your hosts are Jake Henderson and Michael Lewis. Produced by Eric Ledbetter, Elise Van Buren, and Brett Howe. Content and support by Greer Lynch, Robert Kasner, and Connor Olson. Get free access to thousands of loads and book directly through the Convoy app. Download it today in the App Store or Google Play. Visit convoy.com for more information. Truck Yeah! Thank you for listening to Convoy Radio.